Okay, so so very early on, uh, I realized that that poetry was the first thing I ever took serious enough to really study, to really go out of my way to examine how the people before me did everything. Um, music was there before. Music was there. Music was probably there before everything else. Before graffiti, before everything that I did as a teenager, music was there from jump. Um, what music, what music did, was enhance the uh, the palette, give me more colors to work with. Um, I, I think as a as a poet, it works in that sense. But obviously, having a having a band and, and being a musician. I think I'm just a poet that plays guitar. I'm not, I'm not a really guitar player that writes poetry per se. If you want to switch those things around, <coughs> but I'm a poet that happens to be in a rock band, but it's not a poetry rock band, which is always the uh, that thing I try to like. Oh, you know, no one's really doing that typical poetry mm -hmm. voice, and we're, we're not playing jazz. Um, so it got to a point at a, at a very early age. Um, when I started writing, I started performing almost, you know, six months later. I was, I was 18 when I started performing. And... How old do you know? <laughs> about, about... No, no, I, I'm 34. 34, 34 okay. So I've been, I've been performing for about 16, 17 yeah. years. And um, the, the thing was that I... I had a really short period of being a performance poet of being a, a slam poet and being a performer like that period for me was part of the shortest because to me at the end of the day reading a poem is, is ten times more important to me than performing a poem uh, and that's why if, if you ever if anyone really ever sees me anymore in the last few years I, I read off paper because uh, one, one of my things is that for such a long time, the concept of writing and the concept of reading were, were things that weren't, weren't allowed to Latinos, mm -hmm. especially in English. Like you know, so so that so to me, it's always a, a, a an honor to hold paper and to be able to read on paper on stage for someone to to hear the story and to appreciate what I'm doing as a writer. Do you perceive that as a kind of revolutionary act or? It, not not revolutionary, but I, I think subconsciously it might be me taking a stand to the fact that uh, sometimes when you're a performer, you might lay wayside to certain uh, grammatical things and certain page structures that you may not be conscious of when you're performing. When you're performing, you you know you perform and you put your arms out, and, and I, I've been through all this, so. You know, like I tell people, if I'm, if I'm going to talk shit about a performer, it's because I've been there, so <laughs> I know what it is. But, you know, you can't really perform, you know, Stefan Malamé's The Door of Chance is, you know, dictated by the roll of the dice, the, the, the real free verse poem. That you can't perform those kind of poems that are, are scattered all over the page. Right. They're, they're just, you just read it, and this is what it is. So I think that there is a multi a multifacet on how you structure things on page and how you perform it. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, performing has always been something that I need to get their attention. Um, I'm probably, I probably speak the clearest I ever do is when I'm on stage, because if not, I just mumble, and uh, that's never a good thing. And I, I just, I, I studied a lot of poets. One of my very first mentors told me that you have to read, and, and that's what I did. So I studied I studied a lot of, um, almost all the New Yorkans from the first generation, uh, the black arts movements, the, uh, the, the real hyper-political poets from Latin America. Mm -hmm. You know, Neruda, Nicanor Pacra, Castillo from Guatemala, Roque Dalton from Salvador, um, Clarice Valgueria, uh, Octavio Paz from the earlier work. So like, I, I wasn't trying to just be this Puerto Rican writer that talked about Puerto Ricans in New York, even though I still think that it's, it's amazingly important since we've been here almost over 100 years, per se. Um, 
So yeah, so the voice is has gotten to a point where it's it's a very serious voice. I don't really crack jokes. Well, I do crack jokes, I think I catch people off, off guard. Um, but it's a very serious voice because I feel it's the, the only thing I've ever taken so serious enough that people would allow me to use that time and space in that sense. The, what, is, is, was there a, a, a singular point of departure in, uh, like you said, in your late teens when you started to perform in general? Um, was there something that sparked it that you saw? An, another performer or musician where you thought, I want to do my own take on this? It, it's just, you know, I didn't get into, like I was performing, you know, open mics and, and doing shows, but I, I didn't start slamming until my mid-twenties. So I didn't get, I didn't, I didn't feel like the audience dictated what I had to talk about. Mm -hmm. And that, that might have been because I was, I shied away from slam at a really early age. From like 17 to like 24, I, I never went to a slam, I didn't see a slam, I knew what they were. I knew, I knew what people went through, I knew the people who got famous from it, I knew all those things. But the very first slam I went to at the New York weekend was hosted by uh, Luis Reyes Rivera. He called me to come down and I read this, the, 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 book, the poem I have called The Creed of a Graffiti Writer. And it's a, you know, I read it really fast because in my head there's this three minute poem, that I, no, a three page poem that I need to get out of my head as fast as possible, <laughs> not stumble over the words and my mouth is getting dry because I'm talking too much. And I got like a 19. And, and you know, Lewis was just like, ah, oh, come on, you guys are idiots. And you know, for me it was like, look, I came out here because you asked me to come out here. This, is, this isn't really high on my list. When I did start slamming was when my first book was, my first book was finished. And my publisher goes, well, you have to slam now. And I go, why? He goes, the network is too big for you to ignore. I go, okay. So I did some slams in Chicago. They were they were they were cool. Like I really liked the Chicago scene. Just in general, the Chicago writers had a lot to do with how how, how I developed in say like that second stage of your life from like 15 to 22 was like you know just me writing poems and how things come out. But from 23, 24 to 27, you know all I did was hang out with writers. Even when I got to New York, like I just kept hanging out with poets and so the vocabulary and the subject matter got different. Cool. So when I did when I started slamming, I I still didn't feel dictated. Once or twice maybe, I had a poem that people were like ooh, you know, like, yeah. but and then after my son was born, I just you have to have a fire to do those things. Yeah. And for me, it was like look, I have to go to work and I have to keep writing. And then around '05, I decided to start the band because I go well if I'm not if I can't do it now, it's never gonna happen. And um. And that's it. So I think the, the voice that I have is, it's funny because like, I, I, can, I can see how people are affected by who they're mentored by. And if I needed to tell someone, if someone needed to go, so who would you think you sound like? Uh, to me, it's always like I'm in the middle between Willie Perdermo and, and Tony Medina. Because those, those are two that I really looked up to when I was younger. So, so you know, I, I have... I have Tony's volume with like Willie's storytelling. I had a, we had a, I had a show once. It was it was me, Willie, Tony, and my publisher Shaggy Flores, who who went to U.S. Amherst, and uh, you know he was one of the first people that had any kind of faith in me. He lives in Virginia, and um, I always I always thought I I was more Tony because he was like my direct mentor, and that Shaggy was a little more like like Willie. And then when we read, when we read, when all four of us read together, first of us like four Puerto Ricans in like a Baltimore library. We thought it was really, we thought it was really odd. The only other Puerto Ricans in there were like my family. And um, it was interesting because I sounded more like Willie because I was doing these storylines, and Shaggy sounded a little more like Tony because they were both sarcastic, and they had you know these really political poems. I'm like, oh okay, so yeah. So I've always been in the middle, and I've always said that uh, they definitely had an influence on. Because they were one of the first writers I really uh, emulated and admired, and I still do to this day. Uh, any plans for a uh, uh, second book? Yeah, the, the second book is called When the City Sleeps. It is, it is my, my, my homage to a, a, a magnificent city that I think gets kind of a, 
shafted by the wayside in terms of how magical it can be. Uh, when you read, uh, like Spanish poets talk about Spain during the you know, like the generation of twenty nine, like uh, generation twenty seven. It's one of them too. It's they 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 speak about it like oh, every building has this cloud of magic coming off of them. You're like. New York has that. I mean, we're a little more phallic and, you know, American, <laughs> American architecture is, is very different. Yes. But I think there is a, a tremendous amount of, of, of magic in this city that if you don't pay attention to it, you won't see it. I think it's one of the most magical places I've ever been to. I mean, if you look at someone's face and they've never been here, the first time they come here, they're like, wow, this place yeah. looks like a dream half the time. Mm -hmm. Because it is. So yeah, a lot of it, you know, one, one of my favorite poetry books is Poet in New York by, by Garcia Lorca. And it's not, you know, it's not this surrealist book. It's like this really depressing book. Yeah, he had a hard time here. Yeah, well, <laughs> he did. Well, well, he was here, you know, during winter. Anyone has a hard time here during winter. Uh, but, you know, I saw New York in such an a, a interesting light when I read that book. Um, so, so when I started, uh, after Fellow Bueno, the first book, after that was finished, I had all these poems about about New York because I was living in Chicago, and I always think when you detach yourself from what you're writing about, all, all these things start fl flooding in. So then, so all these poems I had about about New York, and and just experiences and and boroughs. So through the years, you know, trying to fix this up with the band, you know, they're both finally finished in certain ways. Do you want to read something for us? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is, um, yeah, okay. this is called Dreaming New Yorican. Um, on New York soil, our soul bleeds South Bronx rice and beans with an aesthetic of banderas y bomba y plena. Barrio festivals and a museo, hip hop in the walk, rock and roll in the swing of the arm. His body hangs in front of village store vinyl shops with Fat beats that provide hard beats for headphones and head bops on long train rides. His language that rocks to irregular hearts like Puente or Poncho. Stories like Rodriguez Lopez solos or La Vol singing blues and reds to shake alive our skin. A Palace Matos poem that burns eulogies for the dead on corner candle altars praising Yamaya or Oshun. The walls holds the spirit of the past and visions of the future. He sleeps with gypsies from concrete jungles, swinging premonitions, melancholy man rays of light, a train rolls, seeking fountains of the bride, strip bare the rhythms of New York, inject themselves into his body, seated nude by three dancers who whisper flashing light, metropolis manifestos in his ear. Spanish mandolin nights where the bulls play outside in the alleys, Guernica was the graffiti of a king's madness permanently stained on his own influence across walls that dream drawing upside down crowns that cut hopeful wrists at 4 a.m. satin black moons with white lines drawn to separate his left from down a relationship with a body that he's never celebrated sitting in the ink he is becoming framed suicides in the painting he is love for an island that has disappeared slowly in shallow water, exiled over a decade, knowing the island will never call him, growing in a puppeteer string tangled. His soul bleeds South Bronx rice and beans and dreams, developing roots on a tree he watches grow and touches the edge of the sky. How proud he is of the beauty of his tree, how the branches bleed poems, bloom roses, and sway back and forth to the rhythm of New York, he cultivates it from the drop of blood that he was, and it grows farther than his dreams, lasts longer than his breast, and he can carve his love right into the bark. Great. Thanks, Bonafide. We'll talk again soon.